Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us on today's webinar. I'm going to just wait a minute or so to, to let people sign on. Wanted to handle some uh, some general housekeeping first, though. This webinar is available for one CM credit. Um, it is being recorded, and everyone will get a copy of the recording in the next couple of days, and it will be available on APA's uh, website as well. And if you have questions, uh, please in include them in the, the box on the right-hand side on the chat box throughout the presentation. There's no need to wait for the Q&A session at the end to write down the questions. We'll, we'll collect them throughout the presentation. Okay, let's get started. Thanks everyone for joining um, and responding to the opioid epidemic. We'll, uh, just a reminder again, this, this is being recorded and so you will get the slides afterwards and submit questions if you have them um, throughout, the, uh, throughout the presentation. So this is part of a, a series, Planning in the Opioid Epidemic. Uh, being conducted. The first one was on uh, January 25th and is available on the APA's website. And uh, the final one will be coming up next month in March. The first webinar focused on some of the background related to the introducing planners to the opioid epidemic and planning. Uh, it's available for uh, continuing Education CM credits, and it's also available on YouTube for those who don't need CM credits. It uh, laid out the common terms of healthy community design, APA's efforts in some more detail, looks at the opioid epidemic through a public health framework, and highlights some efforts underway from the National Association of Counties with the opioid epidemic. This session is focusing on the public health response to the opioid epidemic. Uh, I'm going to do a brief introduction just to bring people who were not part of the first webinar up to speed quickly, and then uh, we'll discuss strategies to address the opioid crisis with uh, examples from Rhode Island and a community university partnership to address the epidemic and op opioid use disorder. And APA has long been involved in healthy communities and has a lot of great resources in healthy community design in general through their Planning and Community Health Center. And there's also a Healthy Communities Collaborative through APA, linking uh, planners and other allied professions to focus on healthy community design. As an interest group, you do not have to be an APA member to participate in the Healthy Communities Collaborative. And there are three subcommittees, so you can get involved in an area of your particular interest. Here's short some how you get in touch with the Healthy Communities Collaborative through email or Facebook. And again, the presentation will be shared afterwards. So healthy community design in general focuses on making the healthy choice the easy choice for our residents. And I think when you look at if the work we do as planners, um, we can see a lot of ways that healthy communities are affected by the work we do in our individual uh, fields in planning, from transportation to air quality um, to access to healthy foods. And social equity is another key element for healthy community design and is particularly pertinent to the when discussing substance abuse and the opioid epidemic. Um, it's important to remember that um, equality is not the same thing as equity. Equality treats everyone equally regardless of differences, so some people still, still fall short of the goals of healthy community design or the programs we're working on. Equity provides resources to achieve those same results for everyone, taking into account the differences of people in their age or population. APA has also been involved in a plan for health project with the American Public Health Association, which was a multi-year effort to further healthy community design. I was involved in the Healthy Communities in PA, which was the Planners for Health project in Pennsylvania. And through that, we did a survey of every uh, planning county planning director in Pennsylvania to help identify what tools planners needed, what issues were, and how they believed they could affect change. So this slide shows in red 
issue, pressing issues that planners around Pennsylvania were facing, and blue shows uh, planning issues that planners felt they, they had the proper tools to address. So you can see substance abuse shows the greatest disparity between planners seeing issues in their communities but not really knowing how to help address the issue. And that helped lead to this uh, webinar series. And we can see that this is an issue in Pennsylvania, but it's an issue all over the country. Uh, it isn't geographically based. And I think we can also look further and see that this is also an issue that's on, a rise, on the rise. So for example, motor vehicle traffic deaths in the US were 10.9 per 100,000 population in 2015 and on the decline, while drug overdose rates are 19.8 and that's all on the rise. And so I think this issue is something that we're definitely going to want to address in the future and figure out how planning can address this issue. So um, just briefly to introduce today's speakers, um, you've already gotten to know me. I'm a local planner with Delaware County in Pennsylvania, focusing on the statewide healthy communities and PA task force. Dr. Brandon Marshall is an associate professor of epidemiology at Brown University School of Public Health. He works closely with the Rhode Island Department of Health on the state's overdose epidemic efforts and directs the preventoverdoseri.org website, a CDC-funded statewide online surveillance system. And Dr. Robert Pack is a professor of community and behavioral health, associate dean for academic affairs in the College of Public Health at East Tennessee State University and director of the ETSU Center for Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention and Treatment. And as they're speaking, please do um, submit questions that you have in the, in the chat box on the side, and we'll have a uh, moderated Q&A session at the end. So I'm going to hand it over to Brandon. Great. Thank you, Justin. All right. Uh, it's a pleasure to present in the webinar today. Thanks for the introduction, Justin. I'm going to spend 15 minutes or so talking about the overdose crisis and what we're doing to address it here in Rhode Island. I'll start by looking just at the state of the epidemic, mostly nationally, drawing on what Justin has already presented and then focusing down in on Rhode Island. Spend most of the time discussing our strategic response, which was implemented in 2015, and then just finish with how we're communicating that progress through the surveillance website, preventoverdoseri.org, that Justin mentioned. So what is the state of, of the epidemic nationally and here in Rhode Island? Um, this is a figure from the New York Times that I think does a very nice job visually of showing how the epidemic has grown exponentially really over the last several couple of decades. This is the number of drug overdose deaths in the United States. Uh, and when this was published, the 2016 data were preliminary the numbers now have come in at over 63,000 in 2016, uh, so actually at the top of those estimates that are shown in red. And this is well in excess of the uh, number of gun deaths at their peak in 1993, and also the peak number of deaths due to HIV and AIDS in 1995. So for many of my students here at Brown, uh, I tell them that this could very well be the epidemic of their generation, much like HIV was uh, for earlier public health researchers and activists. Just visually, another way to look at this is spatially. Um, this is from the same article in the New York Times that looks at the rate of drug overdose deaths by county in the United States. In 1999, showing really some hot spots in West Virginia and Appalachia, parts of New Mexico and the West Coast. This is what the epidemic looked like last year. So as you can see in this slide, essentially high rates of overdose across the country, rural areas, urban areas, red states, blue states, really many ways you look at it, overdose is an issue now that affects every community um, across the nation. 
When we look drill down now by states, this is uh, most recent data from the CDC showing the increases in drug overdose death rate from 2015 to 2016, and the top 10 states I've shown here for you. Um, you can see dramatic increases in drug overdose deaths in some regions, particularly the District of Columbia had a doubling in only one year, which is just shocking. Uh, Rhode Island was fifth highest in 2015. You can see here in 2016, we dropped down to 10th, and that's simply of a function of the fact that we increased more slowly than some other states like Pennsylvania, which actually jumped ahead of us. Uh, so we're still a very, very highly affected state, but our epidemic, as you'll see, is looking like it may be stabilizing and perhaps declining, hopefully for reasons which I'll talk about in a little bit. Going down now, looking by age, overdose used to be an issue that primarily affected people in middle age. In the early 2000s, the highest rates were in the late 30s and early 40s. Over the last decade or two, the number has, or the, the ages uh, most highly affected has shifted. And you can see here in the slide that concerningly in 2016 was the first year that the rates were actually highest in younger people, 25 to 34, commiserate with a dramatic increase in overdose rates in older people as well, aged 55 to 64. And that's largely due to an intertwined epidemic of illicit drug use, and we'll talk about how fentanyl is affecting the illicit drug use overdose epidemic and an ongoing epidemic of prescription opioids, which tends to affect older populations more heavily. The vast majority of drug overdoses in Rhode Island, over 85%, and the majority of overdoses in the U.S. are due to a class of drugs called opioids. So what are opioids? These are substances which interact with opioid receptors, which are found throughout the brain. This is a broad class of drugs that includes illicit drugs, such as heroin, and then other drugs used often in medical, both acute, chronic, and surgical settings. Uh, these drugs, when they bind with opioid receptors, create feelings of pleasure, euphoria, and also very effective at um, reducing feelings of pain. And so that's why they're used in medical settings and also um, can be uh, misused or used recreationally. When opioids bind to opioid receptors, they also affect the respiratory system, and that's essentially what causes an overdose. As opioids bind more and more to the receptor, that basically slows down someone's breathing. And an overdose is essentially uh, respiratory depression that happens often sometimes quite slowly. An overdose can occur over a period of one to two hours. Classically, we see what's called the overdose triad, which are three symptoms um, that are all due really to respiratory depression, breathing slowly, having trouble waking the person up and turning blue or having the skin to, uh, look very pale. And so I just like to highlight these symptoms of overdose in case you're in a very unfortunate circumstance of witnessing one. The real key thing here is to call 911 immediately. Um, and if naloxone is on hand, administer that naloxone, which is an effective opioid overdose antidote. Um, for those who are trained in CPR, also to initiate rescue breathing, again, because an overdose is essentially a severe respiratory depression. So I wanted to talk a little bit about fentanyl. This is a highly potent opioid, uh, which used to be, which is still used in often surgical settings in the US um, and is up to 100 times more potent than morphine. This figure shows here a lethal dose of heroin, 30 milligrams, compared to a lethal dose of fentanyl, about three milligrams. Fentanyl is increasingly be cut in, being cut in the illicit drug supply in the US, predominantly in heroin, but has also been found in cocaine and other illicit drugs and counterfeit prescription pills as well. It's put in there because it is very potent and it's very easy to traffic because uh, such small quantities, small quant quantities are required. And this is what is really driving the overdose rates in Rhode Island and in many other states at this point are deaths due to illicit fentanyl. Uh, and this is another reason why we're seeing such rapid increases in deaths among young people because fentanyl is so potent it essentially makes the risk of overdose for every use event much, much higher than it used to be. So where sometimes it would take decades of heroin use to result in a fatality, we're now seeing fatalities much, much earlier in someone's drug using trajectory, largely due to fentanyl. 
We've, I've been doing some work with the Rhode Island Department of Health understanding what fentanyl overdose looks like in Rhode Island. This was a study we published recently in the International Journal of Drug Policy. We collect with the state information at the address level on where every single overdose fatality event occurs. And we're doing a lot of interesting research on that geospatial data right now. I'm happy to talk about some of our other findings. Um, one thing that might be interesting to this group is that over 90% of fatal overdoses in Rhode Island happen in private residences, which is quite a bit different than what you might hear in the news as coming out of Philadelphia or San Francisco or large urban centers such as Boston. Here we predominantly have an epidemic of people using drugs alone in their homes, um, and that is difficult and challenging for intervention. These figures are a hotspot analysis where we compared the hotspots of fentanyl and non-fentanyl overdoses. And we hypothesized that the geospatial distributions would be different in some way. But as you can see, the geospatial clustering is actually strikingly similar. And this suggests that fentanyl is broadly contaminating the illicit drug supply in Rhode Island. It's not being pushed by, say, one or two drug dealers operating in a community in Rhode Island. Rather, it's sort of infiltrating the illicit drug supply very broadly and is resulting in in a pattern that is very similar to non-fentanyl overdoses, just much, much greater numbers. And you can see here, primarily in Rhode Island, we're dealing with an urban overdose epidemic. Those towns that are urban are highlighted in dark black. In other areas, such as West Virginia and Pennsylvania, you have more of a mixed uh, epidemic or higher rates in, in rural settings, which is not as much what we see in this state. So I wanted to spend um, the bulk of the time talking about our plan in Rhode Island. The governor in 2014 charged academics, including myself, to write a strategic plan that would help us reach this goal, which was to reduce overdose deaths by one third in three years um, from 2015 and 2018. Unfortunately, largely due to fentanyl, we're not uh, at that goal, but we have been seeing progress and I'm happy to talk about that today and, and discuss some of the interventions that have, have been implemented and are leading to some indications of success. So I won't get into the plan in great detail today, but essentially it's a four pillars approach where we're dedicating resources and interventions into four domains where we think we can have the biggest impact on reducing overdose death in our state. The four domains are prevention, rescue, treatment, and recovery. Prevention really refers to the prevention of high-risk prescribing, reducing the um, number of people who are receiving high-dose opioid prescriptions from their doctors or dangerous co-prescriptions of opioids with other medications that increase the risk of overdose, such as benzodiazepines, which was a major issue in Rhode Island specifically. I'm not going to talk too much about those strategies today. Rescue refers to increasing access to naloxone, that overdose antidote that I mentioned earlier. Our goal is essentially to ensure that that is available in every community and is being distributed through many different mechanisms, through outreach, through pharmacies, and by community-based organizations. It's also carried by all of our first responders and police in the state. And we dramatically increased the rate of uh, naloxone distribution in Rhode Island as a result of those increased resources and that plan. I'm going to focus a little bit more today on our two other um, pillars, treatment and recovery. Treatment in our case is really focusing on expanding and building capacity for what's called medication assisted treatment or MAT. And there are three medications that are FDA approved to treat people with opioid use disorder. Two that we're really focusing on in Rhode Island are expanding access to buprenorphine and methadone. So we'll talk about each of those. And there were three general strategies we're using to increase access to this evidence-based uh, set of medications. The first is expanding access to buprenorphine. The second is the Centers of Excellence program for both types of treatment. And the third is expanding access to MAT at our Department of Corrections. So just to talk a little bit 
about buprenorphine for a minute. Um, this is a medication that be, can be prescribed by providers with training from the federal government. It's about a 10-hour training that providers have to complete. As you can see here, we've dramatically increased the number of providers in Rhode Island who are able to prescribe buprenorphine, um, and that's great. These are often primary care physicians who are working in communities who now can be screening for opioid use disorder and prescribing buprenorphine to people who are struggling. So uh, this is an office-based uh, program, largely, that should be done in primary care settings. The second is a center of excellence program. So the idea is to broadly increase buprenorphine access for all people in the community, for patients that need a little bit more support and who um, might not be entirely stable or have comorbidities. We've also instituted a Centers of Excellence program, which are specialized treatment centers in Rhode Island that provide basically additional programs for patients who need a little bit more services. And they work with those providers uh, to try to overcome some other issues that the patient might be facing or other comorbidities. So these can be both for buprenorphine and also with methadone. Methadone is provided by federally regulated opioid treatment programs, which are specific facilities, and they, in this case, often are centers of excellence or work with centers of excellence to try to improve patient care for these treatment modalities. And the final program I wanted to highlight today uh, is our work in the Department of Corrections. Through some analyses we conducted at Brown, we learned that uh, around 12 to 15 percent of people who died from an overdose in Rhode Island had been released from our Department of Corrections within one year of their death. Those figures are shown here in green. So that's a significant amount of people who are going through the correctional system and are then being released and are dying at a very, very high risk of overdose once they're released. And that's because their tolerance is down and they've not been using opioids in the prison setting. And then we're, they're, when they're released without appropriate social and health supports, they're at very high risk for relapse. And because their tolerance is down, risk for overdose and death. So what do we do to address this in Rhode Island? Well, we started implementing a program-wide screening and treatment program for all inmates in our correctional system. Everyone in our integrated prison and jail system is now screened for opioid use disorder and is offered one of those medications that I mentioned earlier. This is a first-in-the-nation program in a statewide correctional system. These folks are then provided with services after they're released and are linked to community-based treatment. We just published this study last week, actually, showing a 61% reduction in the number of people who have <clears throat> died of an overdose and have been recently released from our prison system. You can see there were 26 people who were recently released and died in the first six months of 2016, only nine in the first six months of 2017. That's a 65% decrease in that population compared to only a 3% decrease in the overall in the other drug overdose deaths. So this program alone has actually led to a 12% decrease in overall all drug overdose fatality in Rhode Island, and it's at least a glimmer of hope that one of our programs seems to be working at having population level impact. We received some media on this um, program, including this. Uh, news article in STAT, which I can refer you to, that was published last Wednesday, um, that describes this program and our work in a little bit more detail. I wanted to close with another uh, intervention that we're putting a lot of resources in in Rhode Island, which is peer-based recovery. These are folks who are ha ex experienced addiction themselves in their own lives and go through a pretty rigorous certification and training program and then work in the community to interact with people who are struggling with addiction. They work in our jail system. They work in our emergency departments across Rhode Island. They work on the street and do outreach and try to interact with people who are struggling struggling with addiction and provide really anything that might be needed, referrals to social services, 
housing supports, um, and also linkages into some of those treatment programs, which I mentioned earlier. So they're really the ones on the front line, um, and we're trying to provide those referrals into treatment for people at risk for overdose who may, uh, who may have um, opioid use disorder. So we're getting a lot of attention for this Rhode Island model, and we're just starting to evaluate these programs more rigorously now. So stay tuned for more data as we evaluate these programs more comprehensively. I'll just finish with a, uh, in a couple of minutes here with some information on our surveillance website, basically just highlight it for you. Let me try to move to the next slide. So as part of our strategic plan, we thought it was important to show the progress and people really wanted to see the data, to see quantitatively what the epidemic looks like in Rhode Island and how we're doing. So I direct our information and surveillance dashboard, preventoverdoseri.org. I'm just at my time, so I won't really go into it, but I encourage you to check it out after the webinar. We have a lot of data that we have visualized and present on the site and a bunch of other resources as well for anyone who might be affected by overdose, family and friends, Friends, first responders or providers. There's interactive maps on the website that provide community specific resources for where to find naloxone, for example, and where to access treatment. We're evaluating this program now and we hear a lot that people like community specific um, resources. Where in my city and town can I go? And what are the, what, you know, what's the information and what does that look like? So we've really tried to make this as community focused and specific as possible. And I think you'll see that if you click on some of the resources. Um, so I think with that, so as not to take up too much time, Justin, I'll turn it over to my subsequent presenter and then I'm happy to answer additional questions at the end of the session. Great, thank you. Turn it over to Robert to um, start his discussion. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I just want to echo my colleagues' um, uh, thanks for just reaching out to uh, offer this opportunity to he and I. You know, it's so vitally important that we work between sectors. You know, the the planning sector and the um, and the public health sector. I think can work uh, well together and uh, have a lot to learn from each other, uh, as was certainly the case um, in our situation here in East Tennessee, and I'll, I'll uh, share more details about that in a few minutes. Uh, just to give you a bit of context, um, I just want to mention that, that the opioid use disorder is really thought to be present in about 1% of the population, and it may be an underestimate at this point, but this is from the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, which takes uh, participants, uh, respondents rather, through a series of questions on um, you know, sort of diagnostic criteria. And so about 2 million uh, folks in, in the 2015 uh, NISDA uh, survey had uh, substance use disorder involving prescription pain relievers, and about 600,000 or less had a substance use disorder involving heroin. Heroin's pretty dangerous, as, you, as everyone likely knows, uh, about 25, 23 to 25% of individuals who use it go on to develop an addiction. Um, historically, prescription pain killers were not thought to be quite so risky, um, and there was a massive amount of uh, prescribing uh, that I think most people are probably pretty aware of at this point. Um, and the last bullet point on this slide just illustrates that, that um, about 80% of new heroin users uh, actually started out misusing prescription painkillers, and as the supply of those began to really um, uh, diminish the uh, the um, the demand for other opiates uh, really became pro more prominent, and that's where the heroin market began to grow. So uh, that's that's kind of where we are at this point. Um, so the next slide, I <laughs> you know it's pretty similar to one that uh, Dr. Marshall showed, um, but I, I put it on here for a reason. Even after um, I had a glimpse at the at his slides yesterday. Because um, I want to point out that that on the um, on the map on the left, there were two counties in 2003 that actually had overdose death rates or or drug poisoning death rates rather um, greater than 30 per 100,000. One was McDowell County, 
West Virginia, that one right there. And the other one was Rio Rebus County, New Mexico. Really poor counties. Uh, these are, you know, at the bottom of the list in terms of um, uh, all of the indicators for socioeconomic status. And that's fairly, that's, that's part of the story here. Um, what is interesting about this, this one in central Appalachia is one that we watched uh, closely being in this area and uh, began to grow quickly out from there into this uh, area of southwest Virginia, uh, southeastern Kentucky, and then up into Ohio and West Virginia uh, rather quickly after 2003. And, and uh, now, as, as uh, everyone knows, we're, we're dealing with a nationwide phenomenon. Uh, in Tennessee, we're actually, um, I guess, probably five or six counties away from this county in, in uh, McDowell County, uh, south, southern West Virginia. We're right here in, in northeast Tennessee about four hours from Nashville and about eight hours from Memphis. We're as far away from Memphis as you pretty much can get in uh, the state of Tennessee. Fairly large state, about 500 uh, plus miles across. Um, we have, uh, in 2016, we had uh, 1,631 uh, drug poisoning deaths in the state uh, at a rate that's about 24 and a half. And, um, that's significantly less than than the numbers that uh, Dr. Marshall was showing earlier. Um, it has been a, a place where we have taken this this uh, problem very seriously, um, and it's interesting. Over time, you can see certain you can see different counties making progress, and other counties beginning to slip um, in a very troubling way. The ones with that are making progress tend to have better infrastructure, better planning better connection to the governmental priorities, et cetera. Um, our local efforts really began in about 2012 uh, to address this, and, and really they really grew out of a, uh, an effort on campus uh, to, to begin to take the problem more seriously. Many of us were paying attention to it and you know, having seen uh, what was happening in, in southern uh, West Virginia and um, Southeast Kentucky, and, and so we formed this interprofessional working group in 2012 uh, with a focus on being able to do some research and outreach education, but uh, probably more importantly, begin to think about systems level interventions that we might be able to, to, um, to tackle in order to have some impact. Uh, we actually have about 240 people on the email list at this point. We kind of each meeting uh, really starts with introductions and sort of asks, you know, who else needs to be here, and uh, what else is um, uh, what, what's going on in the community. Um, about 20 to 40 highly engaged stakeholders out of that larger email list show up every month, and it's it's really a different group every month. But uh, we all learn from each other, and uh, it's really more of an opportunity to listen to each other more than more than anything. Uh, we we do meet on campus and off campus in order to facilitate uh, learning from uh, from the community. Okay, so this just this, this slide just illustrates the, um, the diversity of different professions that are represented there, and you can just tell that that uh, you know we're actively seeking out different different perspectives so that we can um, so that we can learn more about what's happening. Um, I, I view this working group is very fertile ground for new projects and new initiatives. And um, one of them, I guess early on in 2013, we were awarded a, a NIDA grant to um, develop research infrastructure and to, and to conduct research on the problem. And, and we've used that, in, that research infrastructure development opportunity to, uh, we've leveraged all that uh, into, into the larger um, uh, impact in the region. Um, it, what it really does, I guess, the working group more than anything helps us get a lot of different perspectives on the problem, and and uh, out of that uh, grew the vision to create a center for prescription drug abuse prevention and treatment, kind of based on a cancer center model, where you might have a patient care core, a research and evaluation core, education and outreach, and, and an admin core, 
And the patient care core is something I'm going to talk about in, um, in detail here in, in a few moments. Uh, the framework that, that we developed to really talk about the problem is one of the continuum of addiction. This is kind of the big picture, and I'll, I'll take you through it um, sort of piece by piece. This, the continuum of addiction from non-use to potential overdose death um, is just represented along this line. And it's greatly simplified, obviously, but uh, the further you go down that continuum, the harder it is to sort of get back out of it. Um, and that's just represented here by the by the red um, uh, band. And then sort of in that danger zone or that sort of red oval there, um, that's that's the space of dependence and, if you will, uh, development of, of uh, opioid use disorder. I guess formerly known as addiction. We're trying to move away from that vernacular uh, in the field at this point. Uh, obviously, it's easier to move back out over into non-use if you just uh, begun initiating misuse. Um, and that that purple space of dependence is really the space of physical dependence, uh, where you know you've, you're growing intolerance for the uh, for the opioid. Um, and we say that there's this is a complex problem, but we have a lot of effective tools and 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 it's just to illustrate the fact that different things work at work differently in terms of their they have different impacts along this uh, continuum and really you're going to have much greater impact with prevention programs that, you know um, in terms of return on investment and I'll share some of that that data here at the I guess at the end. Uh, but development, or rather dissemination and implementation of prevention programs is really a priority. Prevention programming can take the form of, of uh, health professions training, continuing education. It can uh, take the form of early interventions um, with uh, high-risk groups. Uh, but really, uh, you know, you're going to have the best impact with primary prevention programming. Uh, some of the work that we've done in this area uh, we've partnered with our elected officials uh, to really prioritize um, prevention programming for people in the workforce uh, so that they can access employee assistant programs uh, earlier. Um, we, we've learned that the folks that um, the elected officials rather are very, very interested in anything that can harm a workforce in a state. Uh, particularly a state like uh, Tennessee, where we have a lot of different um, manufacturing sites and, and uh, agricultural sites and so on, it, it, it can be very problematic if uh, you have a group in the population that, that doesn't access employment opportunities or, and or is disabled due to opioid use disorder or other substance use disorder. Um, we've engaged with other uh, types of prevention programming, including uh, evidence-based parenting, and have had a, a good success in that arena uh, in terms of training and, uh, and promotion through a uh, coalition that was developed out of the working group uh, for a, a local rural county. Uh, second area, I think, uh, you know, the, just about every state, I think every state now has uh, mandated or or voluntary um, use of prescription drug monitoring programs and diversion control programs. And uh, that is uh, going a long way toward uh, helping to control some of the supply side, um, but also you know, helping people in primary care um, if they present with some sort of substance use disorder by engaging in screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. Uh, in Tennessee, we've had uh, some success in and basically moving people uh, uh, into early intervention through this uh, screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment, uh, trying to implement that statewide. And that's a statewide initiative uh, out of the Tennessee Department of Mental Health and Substance Use Services, who's taking this problem very seriously. So we've got about order of magnitude more, um, more screenings uh, at this point. So on down the continuum, you know, it's more appropriate, I guess, for folks that, that are suffering from a proper opioid use disorder uh, to engage in medication-assisted treatment or absence-based uh, treatment. Um, typically, um, medication-assisted treatment has been met with some resistance, uh, both by the provider community 
uh, as well as the recovery community. There's all kinds of different stigmas associated with it that I'll discuss um, shortly. But I guess one of the things that that um, that we felt was a, a real need in our area was there were only 12 methadone clinics in the entire state. Uh, there, were, there were 12, and there were, the closest one in Tennessee was about 100 miles from here, down in Knoxville. And uh, there, there's some across the border in North Carolina over in Asheville. But, uh, but Tennessee residents in Northeast Tennessee didn't have access to methadone. And so um, we decided to partner um, with Mountain States Health Alliance, our largest regional uh, healthcare system, and our largest community mental health services board, Frontier Health, uh, to um, open a methadone treatment facility called an outpatient or an opioid treatment program. Highly regulated. Uh, these, these are places where folks go in and they gain access to methadone uh, that will then subsequently relieve their cravings for about 22 to 24 hours. They come back the next day, they get some more, they have to have uh, regimented um, sequence of counseling. Um, uh, you have to go to the program um, in a way that is, I guess, demonstrates. Um, uh, compliance with standards uh, for some period of time before you can even uh, have any take-home doses. And so the, the idea is that you control diversion of methadone while also uh, allowing folks to have, gain access to counseling uh, as well as other uh, services that can help them, you know, get their life uh, back, back in, um, uh, you know, back in order. And it is a, um, uh, it's been a an interesting an interesting road. Uh, I guess the first <laughs> first thing I'll discuss relative to this is sort of the pathway to get methadone approved here. Uh, we had to do a certificate of need. Uh, we had to do multiple hearings related to the uh, zoning for the facility, and that's directly relevant to the planning organization. So uh, it's a it's we had the plan, I guess we initiated the plan in May of 2016, and it took until September 2017 to get the doors open. When I say that, um, that we initiated the plan, this is really the press conference where we, we um, first talked about it, and everyone looks like they're in pretty good spirits here. Uh, this is, I'm, I'm on the right. Um, the president of the health system is in the center and the university president is on the left. And um, shortly thereafter, um, there was a group of, of uh, folks in the community where we wanted to cite the, the clinic that organized and uh, basically began to uh, fight having the methadone uh, clinic in the, in the community. Um, these are very good people. We think that they're, you know, I mean, these are our neighbors and, and so on. This is, but it is very much a, a not in my backyard sort of thing when it comes to methadone. Um, I think some of it's related to, to the stigma associated with it. Some of it's related to just misunderstanding. For example, we saw a fair amount of, you know, no meth in, in my community. And that, that's sort of um, pushing together the concepts of methamphetamine and methadone, which are two completely different uh, drugs. This is one of the community hearings about the, uh, about the clinic. Several hundred people were there, and uh, everyone that wanted to got a chance to speak. Um, and uh, we have there's a bunch of signs and and so on in the community, uh, including protesters at our uh, zoning appeal hearings, as well as our city council hearings that uh, had to approve the zoning uh, for for the uh, for the clinic. And you know it was it was actually we actually put it into a, a place where there was formerly an urgent care, and um, it was just an artifact that it wasn't zoned for this particular type of uh, clinic at the time, which was MS-1. Um, so fair amount of fair amount of <laughs> of difficulty uh, for some period of time, but it did lead to a lot of excellent um, conversation in the community, and we, and we really got a chance to. To discuss things like stigma, and we got a chance to discuss, uh, you know, the efficacy of medication-assisted treatment, and 
uh, and got to lay out some some of those things as um, as we went through the whole process. It did take quite a long time uh, to go through the different hearings, and um, I, will, I will say that um, I don't think that any any one that is starting a clinic like this would, would uh, um, necessarily. I think each one is going to be unique, right? There's going to be more and more resistance uh, in different in different areas. This is a largely conservative region, and it is um, it's an area that historically, you know, has actively tried to keep for-profit methadone clinics out. We're a nonprofit that's uh, it's a wholly owned um, corporation between actually two institutions: the East Tennessee State University Research Foundation and um, what was formerly Mountain State's Health Alliance, but is now Ballot Health. So there's a fair amount of stigma, as you can see here, and as you probably read through on this slide. Um, and it's not only stigma among um, the community, but it's also in healthcare professionals. A lot, of, uh, a lot is made about methadone being a crutch. Same is true for buprenorphine, actually. And, uh, and even one headline in the, in the paper, nearly verbatim, um, Stated uh, replaces one drug addiction for another. Um, so you know it, it did give us an opportunity to educate and uh, to have this community level conversation. So uh, these are just two slides back to back that just point point to um, you know the effectiveness of methadone in terms of keeping people retained into treatment and what their long term effects are uh, with respect to illicit opioid use. Um, these are basically reviews of review articles, sort of a very high level of, of, um, of uh, demonstration that the, that the uh, treatment is, is good for keeping people, um, pe keeping people engaged in treatment and, and preventing further illicit use. This is just for buprenorphine maintenance therapy, uh, which uh, Dr. Marshall, uh, I think, uh, discussed well, and, and uh, this just, and then the next slide actually just talk about the broad impact of stigma uh, and how, you know, stigma in a community can actually prevent people from gaining access to care. And, that, and we really want to turn up access to care if we're going to be able to keep people alive uh, with it. Uh, the clinic actually uh, is now open, um, and uh, that was a picture of it. <laughs> uh, we've also been engaging in uh, this problem of neonatal abstinence syndrome uh, and trying to help uh, different clinics understand what their role is in that and, and help different uh, families understand, you know, how to best uh, best approach that that uh, potential outcome. And I say it's a complex problem for which we have many effective tools. Uh, naloxone is, is another one. And uh, this person is uh, Dr. Sarah Melton, who's just a real uh, public health hero. She's, she's a pharmacy professor uh, but she and um, some of my other colleagues have uh, designed some naloxone training that's been accessed more than 38,000 times at this point. Uh, it's actually train the trainer kind of program, and so these the 38,000 people that have gone through it are now all also equipped to train others to to use naloxone. And we're also uh, highly engaged in in trying to improve the status of uh, recovery courts um, and also. You know, this one's a little tougher because uh, you don't necessarily um, flip a switch in a, in a recovery court that, that complies with uh, National Drug Court Institute standards. That Those two things don't necessarily go one-to-one -one because the local courts have a lot of um, control over what they choose to do. But uh, the good news is uh, that the recovery courts are, are increasing dramatically in the state. Um, when I say it's a problem for which we have many effective tools, um, the tools are um, basically significant. You have great, much greater return on investment to the left of the continuum than you do on the right. And uh, this, this uh, slide just illustrates how much more, in fact. Uh, we've learned some key lessons here. Problems uh, very large and growing faster than we anticipated. Uh, there's a lot of people making money on this. And that's what supply side drivers mean. There's a lot of a lot of people money, making money on this problem, and uh, that has led to some real difficulties. Um, 
efforts to address the problem have historically been fragmented. Uh, another problem I think that is um, true uh, for a lot of public health um, issues is that when programs are reliant on grant funding, uh, not only are the programs fragmented, uh, they're not very sustainable. And so what we've tried to do with the clinic is we set up a partnership with Mountain States Health Alliance where the revenues after the, the cost are reinvested back into the center so that we can expand our prevention and other uh, outreach efforts. Um, I think it's also imperative that there's a, a conversation with planners and uh, people that are in the community that can uh, that can influence policy related to siting, and uh, that's of utmost importance, um, particularly to this audience. Um, elected officials are very much concerned about the workforce. Uh, you have to engage with the affected community, including, I, I have to applaud Dr. Marshall's emphasis on peer recovery specialists, which is a, a, a very important uh, group to, um, uh, to be working with, and, and I would encourage all of the listeners uh, that, that can to begin to be engaged in that concept as well in their local communities. And that stigma and addiction, um, stigma about addiction and mental health is still very, very common. On the last uh, slide, uh, last slide for which um, have any, any advice is uh, that if you're going to fully respond, you have to have some coordinated effort between the government uh, and the communities. Uh, you, gotta, you have to stay current on data, uh, and and the data needs to be uh, released and consumed uh, quickly. Uh, one of the issues with public health informatics is that often the data is is far too old uh, to be useful. Um, you know, when when it's held too closely by different entities, uh, it needs to be good community engagement and conversations. This concept of public-private partnerships is underexplored. And um, uh, I feel like uh, you know there's some unique uh, potential opportunities here with uh, in partnering with different treatment services uh, and public health that that can be that, that can be evaluated and then and then disseminated later on that, that may be able to inform policies in other places. Uh, we need to be adherent to evidence-based practices and then uh, take them out to scale. And we need to support, evaluate, and expand local efforts if there are good novel efforts that are working. Um, last thing is I uh, would like to acknowledge uh, a large group of folks that I work with that, um, that have been uh, so instrumental in, um, in moving things forward here in Northeast Tennessee. Uh, happy to answer questions at this point. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, again, the, the presentation is going to be available afterwards, but well, we've had a lot of great questions come in. I guess one to start for uh, both of you is, uh, how did your states develop your strategic plan around opioids? What was the process? How, how are the states ensuring implementation and how are they funding some of, some of this work that you're doing? Is it state or federal funding? Sure, I can take that, Justin, from Rhode Island's perspective. <clears throat> um, the strategic plan that I mentioned was drafted by an academic research team, um, including experts from Brown and other institutions and community stakeholders. Um, it was then endorsed and is being implemented by a task force that our governor convened with a number of high-level leaders from different stakeholder groups, um, state agencies, um, and other places. So they are the central coordinating group and then also are working to ensuring that it's being implemented with high fidelity. So every month we have a task force meeting, people come and present on their progress, um, they troubleshoot any sort of barriers that the program might be encountering to implementing that part of the strategic plan and so forth. The funding is from a number of different sources. We're lucky to be one of the states that has received quite a bit of funding from SAMHSA as part of their targeted opioid response initiative. Um, 
We, uh, my work on the dashboard is funded uh, from a separate drug overdose prevention grant from the CDC, which other states uh, also receive. Um, we decided to invest some of those funds in the surveillance program and, and that the website um, takes sort of the public face of. And um, then also the MAT program in the Department of Corrections is actually funded by out of the governor's uh, general fund. Um, and so that is sort of an additional add-on to the DOC budget um, and involves a, a community-based provider of MAT being the primary contractor for the treatment on the inside and providing that community um, treatment on the outside. So it's sort of a mixed bag of funding at this point. In, in Tennessee, um, we have not had as high level engagement with academic institutions. Uh, the uh, State Departments of Health and Mental Health uh, and Substance Abuse Services, those two departments uh, have largely been responding to the, the problem using um, strategic plans that were developed uh, for the most part in-house. Uh, they have expanded a lot of their uh, programs um, uh, that they were doing already, um, and uh, they've done that with SAMHSA money. Um, it, you know, we do have some connection to the state related to the um, you know, different coalitions, uh, different grants um, uh, to do different project activities, but we haven't enjoyed the same level of <laughs> connection uh, with the state uh, as my colleague from Rhode Island. Um, there were also a couple of questions related to the siting of the facility in Gray County. Um, you mentioned some of the, the nimbyism and uh, uh, difficulties in locating uh, a methadone clinic in a, a suburban part of the county. Um, I guess, what are the responses now that it is up and running? Has anything changed? Do you have anything specific to, to add about difficulties or, or ways that planners could help with the siting of the situation? We've had no problems uh, at the facility. And, and you know, one, one of the things that, that uh, we learned through this process is that a lot of folks are concerned about crimes and uh, particularly, you know, uh, new crime coming on when there's a new methadone facility. Um, turns out that there was a, a nice study done uh, at Hopkins, I think, in maybe 2012 or 13 that um, it demonstrated that there was more crime associated with the opening of a new convenience store than there, than there was with uh, the opening of a new methadone clinic. Uh, in fact, uh, there are a lot of controls around methadone. Uh, it's it's uh, you know, a situation where SAM, both SAMHSA regulates um, uh, dispensing practices as well as the state, Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services, and there's uh, really good controls inside the clinic on diversion uh, as well as you know we, we can do callbacks random callbacks uh, to make sure that if anyone does have take-home doses uh, and they have been in the program for a while and they have uh, sort of ramped up to that take-home level then they can you know they have to demonstrate that they haven't um, sold it to anyone uh, on the street uh, we've had no incidents in the community um, uh, the the group uh, that was called Citizens to Maintain Gray, uh, to my knowledge, uh, still exists, but doesn't uh, doesn't create any kind of protests uh, or anything like that. Uh, the all of the uproar has died down, um, and that happened shortly after you know our final approval, which was in uh, November of 2016. Yeah, and on on the topic of Stigma, I also wanted to point people towards the first webinar. Liz Blackwell-Moore did a, a great presentation that she got from the Framework Institute that we can also use when discussing stigma uh, associated with addiction and the opioid epidemic. Um, it seems like we are out of time. I know there are a few questions we didn't get to. Are there anything from that that you'd like to, to say for closing, something you didn't get to? Um, I would... I, I do see Go, go ahead, Brandon. 
I, w I would close by highlighting one thing that I think relates to the issues that you were discussing, Robert, and that I didn't get a chance to mention is that, you know, we're putting a lot of resources into expanding access to MAT, both on the buprenorphine side and methadone. And there have been instances, you know, I think we have to regulate expanded access, we have to improve access, but also regulate these um, opportunities and make sure that it's quality care. We have seen in other states some instances where you see um, very, very poor quality buprenorphine clinics pop up, especially because um, they can be it, it provide in an office-based setting. And so we haven't seen that as much in Rhode Island, but there are some, there could be also some planning issues or state regulations around ensuring that the treatment that is provided is of sufficient quality and I think that's going to be a focus for a lot of research and public health practice now that we now that we're trying to scale up treatment making sure that it is um, of high quality for for folks and, and so I think that's the next thing that we need to start tackling this is an excellent point and th there are some very large buprenorphine practices called office-based outpatient treatment programs obots uh, and our state has designed uh, some rules for how they operate in terms of uh, making sure that there's good access to care, uh, good access to counseling, um, you know, really good patient records, uh, that if you're going to be an, if you have um, a license to be an OBOT, uh, and they are being licensed at this point in our state, then, um, then you need to have addiction, American Society for Addiction Medicine level credentials for your prescribers. Uh, you need to have uh, many other quality metrics in place, uh, and uh, you also need to be able to take insurance. Uh, and that's one of the things that's, that's really been driving this is, is some of these um, office-based treatment programs have been cash cows, and a lot of yeah. a lot of providers have moved into that arena, uh, you know, sort of on the side, and uh, the, and it, it begins to also be a supply side driver for diversion uh, of buprenorphine on the street. Yeah, and I think some of those credentialing and regulatory issues may help to reduce nimbyism as well for folks in the community to know that these office-based programs are of high quality and, and do meet certain standards. I think that will be important as they continue to be expanded. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you for offering to speak and, uh, and joining us on this. And uh, everyone else, please look for the, the next and final uh, installment on March 19th. In the week of March 19th, we're still setting a date. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thanks, everybody.